Hello, everyone, and welcome to the book buzz for Gilding the Lily by Justine John. Uh, we are recording this event live exclusively in a Love Books group today. Um, this recording uh, will go out again on the 17th of September. And the author, Justine John, will be there again uh, to answer your questions if you're watching this uh, on the 17th. So do, if you're joining us then, do please uh, put your questions up uh, for the author. And if you are with us live this evening, welcome, welcome. Please do at any point put your questions there um, and we'll put them forward to Justine and, and get in some conversation uh, together. And we also have with us this evening um, a very special interviewer and I'll introduce her a little bit later as well. So uh, just to say as well, please, if you are with us uh, and watching and enjoying what Honey and Stag are doing, please remember we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, and we are covering now a range of genre. Um, you know we're passionate about crime fiction, but we're going beyond now. Um, and so without further ado, please will you welcome in uh, into the studio, Justine John. Hi, my friends. Hi. Hey, Justine. It is wonderful to welcome you in this this evening uh, to mm -hmm. to talk about about gilding the lily. So, if I can introduce you to viewers, if that's okay, um, you used to uh, be part of the corporate life in London, uh, running a successful events company, yes. but then you decided to take a chance uh, and to write the novel. Uh, and that novel that's been in you, you say, since you were a child, the novel that we're going to discuss this evening, um, and domestic noir and psychological suspense. And I'm going to ask you a little bit about that. Uh, when you are not writing, you love spending time with your family, riding your horses, walking your dogs, um, keeping fit and deep hot bubble baths. I love the sound of that. <laughs> but it seems a far, far cry away from that corporate life in London. Mm. Is that right? I, do, I mean, do you, do you find life very, very different now? Yes, incredibly different, actually. Um, it, um, it actually hit home recently when uh, we had lockdown, at the start of lockdown, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for me and my husband and the rest of us here, uh, we actually didn't really find it that much different because we're so isolated where we are and um, our whole lives are really here. They're about the horses, they're about the dogs, they're about us, and which is it's fabulous. We love it that way, but it, it is so different to if we had still been in London. So yes, it's completely different. Completely different, yeah. And Yes, yeah, I can, I can well believe that. Now, now the other thing as well, though, to bring into that, because what you say about sounds like just a beautiful, you know, family family home, great lifestyle, and it sounds such a long way away from what you bring together on the pages of this book. <laughs> okay, and so first of all, I wanted to ask you: um, you had a book within you. You wanted to bring that out. Why do you think, why did you go along the line of, of psychological mystery or, or domestic noir? Because, you know, there's a, there's a range of crime styles to choose from. What was it about this that drew you? I didn't pick it. I didn't ever start off and say, that's the genre I want to be. The book was there. And, and <clears throat> when I wrote the book, that's what it became. So um, it, it, when I very first found someone to help me, an editor and somebody that to, to, to coach me with the writing, uh, you know, when we were discussing what genre it would be, that's what came up in the conversation. But it I never started out, <clears throat> I never chose, I never went, mm -hmm. oh, should mm -hmm. I be a romantic novelist or a crime writer? It was, it, it, the story came first. Mm. So, so, yeah, I didn't... Really and, it, and it makes me think then it makes me think did 
did it pick you? I wonder. I, I often think, you know, when there are stories to be told, it, it's not that we set about writing them down. It's that they beg from within to be told. I absolutely love that, what you've just said, because, um, and I'm not deferring away from Gilding the Lily, but with my next book, uh, it, it's such a, the story is telling itself through me. It's not, it, when I'm writing it, I sometimes feel that I'm not telling the story. So, it's almost like someone else is telling the story through me. Something mm -hmm. is coming from somewhere. I'm not sure where, but yes. I, I, I think, uh, yeah, it chose me most definitely, not the other way around. Mm. Now, it sounds like a very long journey um, going from what started bubbling, bubbling under as a child for it to start to be put down on paper yeah. and then for it to become what it is today. Um, I wonder, I, you know, if you can encapsulate for us, you know, from from the beginning to that publication, what kind of journey did you have with it? Um, I very first started writing, putting stuff down on paper when I was about 15 or 16, I think, and it was in the form of poetry. Teenage angst poetry, actually, um, and very much about how I felt about my parents' divorce. Mm -hmm. um, and it helped me, and uh, it, it uh, helped me ground myself and deal with things and work out what things meant. Um, and from then, <clears throat> I moved to London when I was very young as well. Mm -hmm. I was just 18 when I moved to London. And I started, uh, I joined a writing group to help me make new friends. And I did a lot of courses on the city lit. And all through those years of my London life, I never, uh, I, 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 could, I, could, I could put loads down on paper, but I could, I, could, I could never figure out what the story was. And the reason I couldn't figure out what the story was was because it hadn't happened yet. So it, mm -hmm. it ha I had to mature. I had to go through various stages of life and various experiences and, various ways of learning how to communicate mm. verbally and in, in the written form. And um, eventually one day uh, it was there. It was like, this is it, I have, to start, I have to start writing it now. The first chapter actually I wrote a, a long time before the rest came. But mm -hmm. the rest came uh, and it sort of slapped me around the face a little bit. It was like, here, it's here now, it's here, I have to do it. So. But it, it was only at that moment. Fabulous. Thank you for sharing that with us. Because, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that everybody's process, uh, everybody's journey, they may have things in common with other people, but it is very much an individual experience in, you know, the creative process in a book coming into being. Now, I wonder if as well you could tell us along the way, you mentioned writing group that you joined, you mentioned the City Lit courses that were available, but I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about the influences on, on your writing, on your choices as you've gone on and developed. Um, okay, so I read a lot. Um, I don't have a particularly favourite author. I don't have a particularly favourite genre pick up books <clears throat> based on their covers or what I read inside if I open it up or what I've heard from other people or you know things like this and if I've seen reviews all sorts all sorts of books I love and I am influenced by what I read if I read something <laughs> that moves me um, then I try to learn from that I try to work out what it is and how how it moves me um <clears throat> circumstances poetry a little bit mm -hmm. life things that happen things that change your life you know my moving from the city to the country um the feeling my feelings of achievement um 
I, I'm sort of a person that I I don't like to do anything unless I think I can do it well. <laughs> and, it, and, mm-hmm. and and if I can achieve that, it makes me very, very happy. And so I get a lot from that and I like to try and encapsulate that. So that is a is a big influence. Um anybody who I meet who achieves things through passion mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. an influence to me. Anybody mm-hmm. who can talk about meditation or doing well in life or choosing a certain path. Um there are so many so many influences really very varied mm. Mm. I, I i i really you know appreciate what you say of that idea of just just drinking in or taking in from lots and lots of different angles depending on you know so so beautiful now then to this book gilding the lily let's have a look at that 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 lovely cover which we'll talk about a little bit later on look at that beautiful and impactful I love it. Gorgeous. Um, And in it, you have a number of characters. uh, And I wonder, I'm just going to pick three for the purpose of time. But I wonder if you could introduce to us, because again, if we were to meet these people in real life, what would they be like? And 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 hopefully as you introduce us to them, then we'll want to dive into the pages and, and get to know them a bit more. Even maybe one of them that isn't so likable, but I think you do that very well. Um, so I wonder if you would, you, would you introduce us to Amelia, Jack and Evelyn? I knew you were going to pick those three. <laughs> 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 so um, Amelia is a, uh, it is a, a, a London, a, she lives in London with her husband, Jack. Uh, she's successful in business. She tries very hard. She's not over successful. She's, she's getting there. She's, she's getting by. She's doing well. Mm-hmm. Uh, she runs a small business. She's part of the uh, business community. And she always feels that she wants to do better because she wants to please her dad. You know, mm-hmm. she's a, uh, she his 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 pride in her is is paramount in her happiness she always wants to make sure that he so she goes to him occasionally she asks advice she's uh you know she 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 always listens to what he has to say um she uh experienced much like myself she experienced the divorce of her parents when she was very young and her father moved to New York, and uh, and from then on, uh, didn't see her as often as she would like. And she's been affected like that. She's been affected by that, and uh, to the point where she was always jealous if her father ever met any other women. And her father was, you know, he was he was cool about telling her about things like that, but she. she she felt a little bit out of it whenever he told her she grew up she she set up her own business she got married she decided that actually it's time for everybody to be grown up Mm -hmm. and he told her about this latest woman that he'd met and she thought this is it this is going to be uh this is going to be it I, i i you know she's thinking i need to get on with this person for the sake of the relationship with my father because we're all grown up now let's just get on with it mm-hmm. so that, that's amelia that's amelia uh, and and again i think she sounds like you know a good daughter you know trying to trying to make things work when it's been tricky yeah yeah and she's married to jack as you quite rightly say um i think i think i'm I think I'm developing a bit of super fondness for Jack. Um, <laughs> he's a good guy. Um, tell us about Jack. Uh, uh, Jack's really cool. He's um, he's cool because he takes care of Amelia, and uh, he loves Amelia like no one else has loved her. Uh, he uh, he has a dark side. He he has a temper. He's uh, he's known some strange people he he's an ex-copper and he was on drug squad so he has had 
various experiences in life and uh, he's seen good, bad and evil. And he, uh, he knows some good people and some bad people and he, he still has contact. So he, he, he adores Amelia. Uh, uh, Amelia appreciates appreciates because Amelia is a larger than life and, and Amelia is a, a larger person you know she's not uh, she's not traditionally pretty Jack however is traditionally handsome he, he's mm. dark and curly hair and you know he's he's mm. eye candy Amelia is not and uh, but Amelia loves him more because she she's very well aware of of that and um and she knows that Jack loves her for her and not for necessarily the way she looks. Mm. Um, he, he, he goes deep, he's passionate, Jack. He won't necessarily show that he's passionate uh, to, to, uh, to the world, but, uh, but he's, uh, he, he enjoys the deep and meaningful. Mm. Thank you for that. Now, we have to we have to talk about Evelyn, but I wonder before we do, would you would you mind giving us our first reading this evening? Okay, so um, I would love to read from uh, I would love to read you the because I I love the prologue, and I'd love to read you the prologue. Um, this hopefully will draw you in to the whole story. She stood solemnly at the graveside. A single tear ran down her cheek. A man and a woman stood either side of her and a younger man opposite. They all looked down at the expensive coffin being lowered into their family plot. A few other mourners were scattered around. They formed a small, sad crowd as the priest said the familiar burial prayer. But she barely heard the words as the coffin settled with an audible thump. Commit her body to the earth, for we are dust, and unto dust we shall return. She looked around her. It was a warm, bright day in September, but there was an unusual wind. A hurricane was forecast. There were many headstones here, and a few statues, of angels mainly, different colours, but somehow the same hue. A few trees lined the perimeter fence, some bare, some evergreen. Beyond them, the city buzzed. It went on with its day and didn't notice anyone missing. The woman next to her was wearing a hat that didn't suit her. It kept catching the breeze and the woman's gloved hand caught it each time. It was annoying. She should have pinned it or something. She shivered as a gust blew by them and then smiled inwardly. How is it she came to be here? How is it that it all went so well? Was it her own cleverness or was it luck? The Lord lift up his countenance upon her and give her peace. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen, she joined in. Amen indeed, she thought to herself. The relief was immense. The day after it happened, it flooded through her. How was it that she had been capable of such a thing? And now it was a huge secret. But she had always been good at keeping secrets. It was over now. She could get on with her life. The Lord be with you and with your spirit, everyone replied together. Another gust. She felt it curl around her stockings. The woman next to her snatched her at a hat. God of the living and the dead, accept our prayers for those who have died in Christ. She wiped away the tear. The young man opposite caught her eye and sympathetically smiled. She smiled back in a way that said, yes, I'm OK, thanks. And she was OK. Let us pray. They bowed their heads. Some held hands and some sniffed and they all solemnly recited the Lord's Prayer. Her mouth moved as she mumbled the words, but her thoughts were still elsewhere. It was thrilling what had happened and justifiable. She wondered if she could ever do it again, but the need would never arise, of course. She now understood how others could do it, this criminal act, how other people could get away with it. If she could do it, anyone could. How many people could be getting away with it right now? Thousands? Millions? Was the city beleaguered with people crawling around, getting away with their sins? Gracious Lord, forgive the sins in those who have died in Christ. A 
and it was easier than she thought. She was surprised. That was what surprised her the most. It was just a matter of thinking it through carefully, planning well. Did this make her a bad person? She was still the same inside. She was still capable of love, big love, and still wanted to be loved in return. Isn't that what life is all about? What everyone wants? And she felt more worthy or worldly. Perhaps that was the more appropriate word. She felt more something anyway, and that could only be a good thing, to feel more, to be more understanding of other people and why they do things. Yes, she was still a good person. In fact, a better person. It's not as if she didn't know the difference between right and wrong. What she did was wrong, but also right. She had righted the wrong. It felt good. Kindle in our hearts a longing for heaven. There was a sudden movement from the woman next to her as her hat actually blew off. The woman made a quiet apology and ran gracefully to the point where it landed. The wind allowed it to stay there and she picked it up before returning to her place in time for the next Amen. Amen. Lord have mercy. Would anyone else forgive her if they found out or just God? She looked for the words in her booklet and joined in again. Raise us from the death of sin into the life of righteousness. Righteousness. Was it righteousness really? What is righteousness really? A state of mind, a quality, a knowledge that one is morally correct. What she'd done was morally correct, even though it could be turned bad. So it was righteous. She stood a little straighter, a small movement. Yes, it was righteous. She was righteous. May the love of God and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ console you and gently wipe every tear from your eyes. Amen. Amen, she repeated. Amen indeed. Mm. Amen indeed. <laughs> the, the poetry that exists in that opening, because it replicates back and forth. You know, you, you, there's, the, there's the religious aspect, and then there's what's going on in this character's mind. And it's you know it's the reply and the answer and it and it and it's beautiful the way you you've created that. Um, I mean it, it it moves from from comfort to menace, back and forth, um, and and the notion that you begin the novel with 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 the possibility of getting away with murder. Mm -hmm. So you invite us as the reader. I mean. Are we going to be, I mean, f first of all, who is this? Okay. But then are we going to be on her side because, you know, did she need to do something? Was it necessary? Or is she just a cold-blooded, you know, killer that really we we shouldn't be feeling any sympathy or, or shouldn't identify with? So I love the way you set this up. All that said, want to tell us about Evelyn. The character that you love to hate, maybe. I don't know, but go on. Okay, so Evelyn is, uh, on the face of it, Evelyn is attractive, she's tall, she's knowledgeable, she's clever, she's intelligent, uh, she's witty. She, uh, she draws people in. Um, she, uh, she has money, she's wealthy, she lives in a big apartment in the middle of Manhattan, uh, and uh, she lives the high life. She's had experience, she's got stories to tell, and she's attractive, physically attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, and Roger fell for all of that, Amelia's father. Mm -hmm. And they um, they seem to, 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 to have uh, a great partnership. And um, but uh, Evelyn has uh, Evelyn has Evelyn or Evelyn, however you like to pronounce it, both ways. Uh, she has a past that does come out in the novel, and actually, that will be my next reading. Is going to be my first chapter from her point of view. There's only a sprinkling of of her point of view um, throughout the book. Um, but I, the reason I put those in was because. Uh, uh, when I was first trying to sell the novel uh, into an agency or a publisher, uh, one of them came back to me and said, we need to know more about this character. Mm -hmm. And 
that's when I thought, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put some of there's gotta be a reason why Evelyn is so harsh, why she's so evil, actually. <laughs> um, and there has to be a reason for that. And so I I told some of her past. I allowed the reader to see maybe some of the reason, a partial reason maybe why she was mm. like that. Mm. Everyone always, there's a reason for everyone being hateful. Mm. I'm sure. Even her. <laughs> even even her. And yeah. and that that is that is a beautiful moment. I think if you were um I, I wonder, sh well, no, no, I was going to say, should we have that reading? But let's just, let's sit with the thoughts of Evelyn for a while. Yes. Um, because you said you bring, you know, there, there are a, a sprinkling of chapters written from her point of view. But we also have Amelia's point of view and Jack's point of view. And I just wondered about your process in your development of this novel. Um, how you set about choosing. Mm -hmm. who and when and then the weaving of this tapestry because I, I always find that fascinating when when an author takes these strands and turns them into you know this twisty beautiful tale of in and out talk to us about how the choices that you made and and you know so I experimented when I started writing I naturally started in the first person with Amelia. And um, I tried to deepen her character by bringing in, when I was bringing in the other characters. And I found it difficult to do that without expressing their point of view. Mm -hmm. so, so I did try it on different levels. I tried it all in the third person. And I tried it all in the first person, but only from Amelia's point of view. And I think this is why it ended up being first person in Amelia's point of view and third person in Jack's point of view. Sorry mm. if that sounds confusing. No, it, it, it comes out easily when you read it. Um, but um, uh, for me personally, and I think every author has their way that sounds, and I had this discussion, it's, it's, it's great that you've asked this question because I had this discussion with my writing group recently because some people were saying, you know, shall I do it this way? Shall I do it that way? I find it easier this way that I found it easier. I just found it easier. It just slipped out. It just came out and came onto the page with more grace and with more imagination and with more vocabulary if I wrote it in the first person. Mm. And I often found if I tried to write it in the third person, it would change halfway through and I'd be proofreading it and it would be, oh, I've gone to she, her, not I am so mm -hmm. yeah it, it, that, that's the way that's that's why I chose I think I I think when I was writing Jack uh he his character is more easily told from a from from the third person because of his background I think it's and I don't know I don't know how it's strange because in my second novel I've written I've got four characters in the first person. I was just about to say it might have been easier because to write Jack in the third person because he's a man and I'm a woman, obviously. But with the next novel, I've written two men from the first person. So um it's it's whatever comes easiest. I think it's however the story tells itself through yeah. you. Yeah. Where we were before. It, yeah. I don't think I don't think you have a choice. I think it comes to you. Mm, beautiful thank you and I wonder then is it the same about the setting because split between London and New York and London I, I totally understood London maybe you know because of you know a previous life um but I wondered about New York because there are a thousand intriguing cities throughout the world so why the Big Apple well New York I, I mean I know New York, my, uh, Roger's character is based on my own father. Um, mm -hmm. And I say that with caution because, uh, because all the characters as I was writing them developed their own personality and became their own people aside from whoever I started basing them on. 
but I did start to base Amelia's father on my own father. And um, and I can't lie about the fact that, uh, you know, much of the story is, is, is around what happened to him. Uh, and um, so I knew you, New York. New York is a mm. fabulous, easy, easy city to describe. Uh, it's so full of life and culture and exciting things that I've always wanted to put down on paper. So it's um, it's where it's where it should have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I I was you know looking at, at some of the reviews and and I, I wholeheartedly endorsed somebody says you know you you know where the characters are you know if you know you new york you know where they're walking you know what's you know what's happening you really give that great sense of place mm -hmm. um and 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 you know and the way you talk you know like it, it for you it is a special city and and i think you know that comes out on the page without a doubt so I wonder if you would give us that second reading. Is that okay? Yes. Thank you. So this is chapter four, and it's the first chapter that allows the reader into Evelyn's background. So this is from her point of view. Deep down, I know there could have been no other way. I breathe deeply the scent of sweet protection and pray to the Lord that I never lose it because without my strength, I would be nothing, dead as well. These days, my thoughts are all over the place. That's why I have to take a deep breath and compose myself like this, sit on a chair, slow things down, put them in order, just talk to myself and go through things one by one. Roger will stay with me. He will love me and marry me. He will take care of everything. I saw something in her eyes that reminded me, that girl. She terrified me in the middle of the night, woke me up by whispering evil things in my ear. You good for nothing wet smack, you know but a dingy crumb. You'll grow up to be a hole just like your mama. How I wanted to hurt her, more. I only managed to slap once, a few kicks, and a stab in the leg with a pencil which broke in two. But the reprimands were too painful. She was bigger than me and knew my weak point. I was so young, so unhappy. Breathe deep the scent, slow it down. The home was the old Forester farm outside the city limits of Indiana County. There was a long dirt road from the highway that led there. It went on and on. In the summer, there was so much dust that sometimes I found it hard to breathe. I used to get sick. I used to get a stick and write in the sand. Daisy is mean. Her eyes remind me of Daisy's. Her eyes. Breathe deep. We were mostly orphans, but there were some old people there too. Old people with no family or money. A lady with no husband. Daisy had family, a mother, but her mother couldn't control her. I was there because my father was dead and my mother was sick in the head and was taken away. I don't remember either of them very much. I had pictures of them both once. Whatever happened to those pictures? I learned to swallow the missing feeling, swallow it down like a little pill, all gone. When I was old enough, I worked in the fields, all those rows of golden corn, blood red tomatoes, ugly old potatoes, hate potatoes. Roger loves potatoes and tea. He loves his tea. Clothes and hands were always dirty and sore. My knees too. I remember the schoolhouse because I liked it there. I was in the big barn. It was in a big barn and it smelled of oil from the tractor. I enjoyed the learning. I could sit far away from Daisy. Daisy shut me in the linen closet once where the shirts and pants were kept. No kid earned their own clothes. We just picked from the closet. Sometimes they fit, sometimes they didn't. It was so dark in there. It smelled funny acrid, like rat shit. The panic grew and I screamed until my voice was harsh and my throat sore. The snot dried crisply and the tears stained my face in clean tracks down my dust caked cheeks. I was in there for hours. I thought I might stop breathing. 
I don't like small spaces now. Small spaces and Daisy's eyes. I have to swallow that. I have to swallow down that fact. Sorry. I have to swallow down the fact that Amelia's eyes remind me of Daisy's. Swallow it down. That's in the past. All gone. Breathe the scent. It's something about the colour, the slant. But I must be nice to her. She's Roger's daughter after all. He loves her. She won't get in the way. And she lives too far to be a nuisance. Maybe I will learn to like her. She is nice, isn't she? It was Daisy who wasn't nice. This isn't Daisy. Swallow the pill. Breathe. Breathe the scent. Look how far I've come. I've controlled this. I can do it again. Maybe we can be friends. She was good to me. That time when she helped me up the stairs. That time I was ill. And how I've come and how I'd love to have a friend. As I grew, so did the desire to leave. And one dark night I ran. I think I was 15, maybe a year younger. I remember the hard ground through the hole in my shoe and my breath loud in my head. The thrill of the first couple of hours, scared of every shadow, frightened of each turn. I took some money from the jar in the kitchen, some clothes from the closet and some pie from the cupboard. I thought everyone would wake at the sound of my beating heart. It was summer, warm enough to sleep out under the long bridge. No one saw me and the next day it wasn't hard to get to town. The shop owner caught me stealing apples, but she ended up allowing me to stay for a while. Mrs Cullimore, I think, but I don't quite remember. I told her a different name and I cut my hair short like a boy's. So even if, it did, if they did look for me, which I don't think they did, they wouldn't recognise me. I cleaned in return for board and lodging. I did my very best. She sent me to her sister's farm in Connecticut and I worked there for actual money. I must have stayed there for two years. They're, they were good women. I should have stayed in contact. I was 16 when I met Daniel. He was 18. He worked on the farm next door. I only knew I was pregnant when my body began to bloat. He ran. He would be whipped if they found out. I would too, and thrown out. I was sure. So somehow I managed to conceal it. It came early anyway. I remember the pain in my stomach, my legs, my heart, my back, the force of it doubling me over, paralyzing me. I took off to the woods. In the stream there. I remember the smell of my the smell of the peaty moss and the dead leaves and the blood turning my aching stomach and I buried my face so no one would hear the wailing. I used the leaves and moss to mop up the mess before I plunged it into the water watching the globs ebb and separate. I had a sen I had the sense to take another dress with me and buried the blood-stained one. I swallowed the anger and the hurt, swallowed it down like a little pill, all gone. No one ever knew. They thought I had a fever from the lily of the valley, which was crushed into my hand, and they gave me medicine, but they never knew. Oof. <clears throat> Justine, trauma. I mean, serious trauma. But thank you for that reading. Um, I am just going to take a little moment to compose myself because <laughs> into, the, into the studio, we're going to welcome Maggie, Maggie Russell, a uh, blogger and editorial and marketing manager uh, with Red Dog. Um, and so please, everybody, if you'll welcome Maggie, because she's coming in with some fabulous questions mm -hmm. for Justine. And I just want to say I am so glad that Angie uh, is enjoying this session. So, lovely woman, Thanks, I shall love you and leave you for now. Hi, Maggie. I would say that I totally related to the story because, like you, uh, my parents divorced. Uh, and so, like Amelia, I went through um, my parents' divorce and the years after, and stepmothers. <laughs> goodness, stepmothers. Uh, so, yeah, I really loved I used to call uh, what them you did. Step monsters. There. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> step monster. That's a really good one. I usually didn't call them. <laughs> I was, you know, <laughs> fleeing, I was fleeing the boat, everyone. <laughs> but yeah, um, I love how Golden the Lily plays with the bad stepmom myth. You know, uh, you created an adult version of the fairy tale uh, nightmare, <laughs> literally. So, was it your intention from the start? From the start, sorry, or did you did the characters take you there? Uh. 
um it was my intention from the start yes but uh the the role the character of evelyn was never really a, a, a stepmother because uh yeah. they, he, he roger and her never married mm -hmm. so i think for um for amelia the stepmother was helen yes I'm bringing in another character here <laughs> uh who who she always felt regret that she never tried harder with, but she was so much younger, you know, now she was grown mm -hmm. up, she thought she could handle the situation. And I think maybe imagined that a marriage between the two could, could, could be possible. And so she didn't want to spoil that for her father mm -hmm. after spoiling other relationships that she regretted. So it was a big play on her part to try and welcome this woman but I but I don't think she yet had got to the stepmom part if you know what I mean yes and I, yes and it's, it's really yes that's it's very different yes and uh I loved how Amelia thinks she's learned from the past and she really yeah. tries during the book she, yeah. she tries oh my god I think she's really patient uh I would not have been so patient I think <laughs> um, but there's there are so many subjects like manipulation obsession jealousy uh, yeah. the novel touches many toxic subjects did yeah. you know how far they would take you when you began writing uh, no especially actually with that with the background of Evelyn uh, <laughs> I didn't know that would take me there until I started writing it and um and what um what we were I was saying with Jackie just now it was uh something happened something surprised me and I managed to you know something I read that I just read that and I, I and it made me think where did this come from but I don't I don't know where it came from it just came mm -hmm. it, it, that character spoke to me that character who 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 um who i created came alive and she had that was her background so no it was like it's like when i wrote that it was like getting to know the characters from scratch mm, that's very interesting because uh we often hear authors say that they you know they take on people around them to create characters and stories and backgrounds and mm -hmm. to imagine Evelyn talking to you like hey I'm here and this is my story just yeah I, I find it fascinating like where all that that darkness came from you know it's yeah. wow <laughs> it's it's very exciting to and, and you can feel it I think the more you read Gilding the Lily the more you well get to know the characters and you realize just how many layers there are to every character. And I love what you did with that. So yeah, I was saying about the characters that they seem to fall into categories at first. Really, you know, the bad, the good, and the, I don't wanna have anything to do with it. Like, nope, um, I'm from Switzerland. Nope, I'm not going into that. <laughs> That's how I felt it, you know, with the friends and the people around them. Um, I fell for it, but it was a, it was one of your traps because I really thought it's going to be that easy, you know. I know who the baddie is. I know who the good guys are. So, how was it to write those characters and play with them the way that you did to create all those layers like a giant dog cake? <laughs> well, gosh, it's um, it came with coaching you know mm -hmm. I, I can't say that it was all just me it came from good coaching and learning and um uh, my very first draft was um was very straight up it was a very set story so it started here it went here and then it went there and it was like a line like that <laughs> and um then I took it to a coach and I went, help me with this. You know, I, I'd like to get this published. I'd like for this to go far. And she said, well, the first thing you need to do is you need to add a little bit of, you know, you need to have ups and downs and ups and downs mm -hmm. and then a bigger up and a bigger down. And um, 
so that that helped me to um to dramatize it i think a little bit in the beginning it was just a story and then it became a drama and then it became dramatic and right. then it, by that time that's when the characters because i'd looked into them then i asked them questions i got to know them better i delved into their heart and what they really wanted and why they were like they did and how they justified things anything not the thing just the things they did but other things as well um and that's how i that's how i got there with this but you know sometimes when i when i when i'm reading some of it now i do think i do think i could add more i do think there could still be more wow i i don't think i could take more i mean they're so <laughs> well rounded and you know they really feel real in their uh, flaws and the yeah. the good sides too because you know we all have good and bad sides yeah so exactly, exactly. yes and that's that's what i like I, by the end of the book i was like yes but maybe i don't dislike her that much or maybe i can find it in my heart to forgive yeah. or yeah. try and understand what happens yeah. so i thought it was really really clever of you to bring the reader to grow too, just mm -hmm. like the characters. Mm -hmm. It's very, it was very, very entertaining to see them uh, evolve. And I, I really related to Amelia in, in that point, well, up to a certain point, because, you know, things happen. <laughs> and, I know uh, what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna give any spoilers, but up to a certain yeah. point, you can relate yeah. to the characters. So yeah. yes, it was, I thought it was brilliant and it did scare you to actually you know realize that those people come from me they talk to me and well is there a part of you in each character or are they really you um, know there's strange. definitely a part of me and amelia um <laughs> and not all not all of amelia but but i i do relate i do relate to her the best mm -hmm. um and uh, uh did it scare me um no it didn't scare me <laughs> but it enthralled me i was so curious and it was like i had to know i had to write mm. it i had to find out I, it was impulsive and um and i had to ask the questions and i had to know the answers so if the answer didn't come one day, I had to keep I had to keep pushing, 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 pushing until I got the answer. And eventually I did. You did. And when we got them too. Well, and you know, it all became this really, really well thought out, uh, plotted, character driven story that I really enjoyed. Uh, so thank you. I'm so um, glad you enjoyed it. Yes, I really did. Uh, we're going to welcome back our lovely Jackie now, I think, if Kelly does her magic. Yes. There we go. Kelly's magic. Hi, Jackie. Kelly's worked the magic. I, I yes. love the fact that, and, and I love how she shuffles us around just to get us in the right <laughs> spot. I love that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Kelly, Kelly Lacey, thank you so much for making all these lovely things happen. It's so good to be in conversation like this and hear about people's stories and just thinking, Maggie, you know, there you are in France and we've been able to gather together like this and just enjoy you know, the richness of, of Justine's text together. Now, I know we've been here um, talking about Gilding the Lily and, and, and I know, Justine, you're going to actually give us a treat from the next book. But before you do, could you hold that cover up again? Yes. Because I wanted yes. to ask, okay, so... That, I mean, in, in your reading, you spoke about the lily, lily of the valley that, that, that she holds, that Evelyn holds. But, but I wonder, could you talk a little bit uh, for us about the title and the cover choice, please? Oh, OK. So the title, um, I love my story of how the title came about because I couldn't think I'd written loads. I'd, I'd thought of all sorts of ideas about the title of this book. And I was with my 
writing coach at the time. And every time I went for a session with her, it was like I thought of five different new titles and we and we'd, we'd, we'd see if they would fit and they didn't. And it was just like, what about this one? <laughs> oh, no, I don't think that one. Oh, this one sounds quite good. And it's no, and then, and it, and it just wasn't, 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 wasn't coming. And then I was in boots one day and there was a big long queue for the pharmacist counter. And there was this lady behind me who was quite glamorous. She was an elderly lady. Uh, she had these amazing pair of red boots on and, and uh, everything else was sort of plainish, but these fantastic red boots with little kitten heels. And, uh, you know, when you're in a queue and you've been waiting ages and ages and you're like, oh, and you're sort of looking at each other and everything. And I turned around and I looked at her and, and, I, and we were going, oh, like, it's taken ages. And I looked down and I went, those are amazing boots. They're really, really lovely boots. And she said to me, oh, thank you. She said, well, my daughter thinks I'm gilding the lily, but I love them. And I just went, ding, ding, gilding the lily. It's like, this is so perfect. Why hadn't I thought of that before? Because it gets in the whole lily thing and the whole gilding, the whole everything. So um, that was the moment. That That's the moment gorgeous. That that. <laughs> uh, and the cover, the cover, well, the cover had to have lilies, gild, well, um, lily of the valley on it, which mm -hmm. these little things in blood red um and um a designer helped me with it and he he chose the font and the setting uh and then I asked for the little chinks to be put in in the in the words because I just thought it it's chinky it's like it, it needs cuts out of it mm. <laughs> like that so that's how that came about <laughs> I suppose that's such a brilliant story of of how you never know at any moment in life, you know, the answer might come, the inspiration might come, the the missing bit of the puzzle, and yeah. just to always always be aware, always be ready. Now I wonder though, because you asked. And, and we can never say no when an author asks, because it's really important that you have a new story and you, you wanted as well to share that with us. Um, so uh, thank you, that Facebook user uh, who has just said the, the gorgeous cover and the story sounds intriguing. We totally agree. Um, but the next story, does it have a title already? It does. The title is Beneath the Ceiba Tree. Mm. Oh. Mm. Lovely, lovely. And you're going to read to us a little bit from that, yeah? Yes. I'm going to read you. Uh, thank you for allowing me to do this as well. Um, I'm going to read you the first half of the prologue of this. I'm just going to put the light on, actually, if you don't mind. One second. Not, at, not at all. I can't see much. <laughs> No. That, sorry about that. Oh. Right, so. So this is the prologue to my second novel called Beneath a Ceiba Tree. <clears throat> April 1972. Ed. Thanks, that's better, said Charlie as the torchlight soft yellow glow appeared in the Land Rover's grubby front wheels. I held the beam steady on this hot, dark African night. The dirt road was illuminated by the bright moon, but the torch was pathetic. The headlights had dimmed and we had to feel around like blind mice to find the wheel, to find the wheel jack and tools. The stridulating crickets were loud in my ears and the stars seemed to shimmer. The air was warm and carried a sense of den dense vegetation and sweat. And in case we need it, I said slowly, so as not to worry him, the gun is on the bonnet. I had reached into the glove compartment for the weapon. Hopefully it would not be necessary, but I thought better safe than sorry. I hadn't held a gun before. I was momentarily fascinated by its barrel and the black pitted dry shell of its handle. I daren't touch the trigger. Its grimy promise of demise was evident and its shallow curl and eerily its shallow curl eerily warned me away 
Okay, Columbo, Charlie smirked, help me get these nuts undone. They're pretty solid. Thankfully, only one front tire was completely flat. We had driven over something sharp, that was for sure. We didn't dare go back to find out what it was. It wasn't important. We simply needed to change the wheel as quickly as possible and get out. I looked at my dusty watch, nearly 10 p.m. We had driven for hours from a jetty. Through the heat of the day, past parched mud hut villages with scrawny youngsters in dirty t-shirts, they chased the car like dogs, barefoot and smiling. They waved madly, calling and shouting. We had negotiated deep, rutted, bumpy terrain and were looking forward to reaching the tar-sealed road closer to the city. We were tired, sweaty and achy, and Accra was still more than 100 miles away. Working together, we swapped the wheel in a matter of minutes. We were both pretty fit and strong, though Charlie was thinner and shorter. We were members of the same local cycle club, and I was about to say something about the route plan for next month, when a sudden movement from the bushes on the side of the road startled me. Dread snatched me to attention as a man jumped forcefully through the undergrowth, actually holding a gun and pointing it at us. He was shouting something in African, but then screamed it in English. The light was so bad, I accidentally shone the dim torchlight in his face and vaguely saw his sweaty chocolate skin shining and the whites of his fear-filled eyes. His check shirt was ripped at the collar and I wondered with surprising clarity why I noticed. Shocked, I moved backwards and came into contact with the car so suddenly that I dropped the torch and it rolled away into the shrubs, but remained on, dimly illuminating the greenery. As I stepped forward to follow it, the man moved in front of the car, as though dodging me. I thought about the gun, but couldn't reach it without an obvious movement, which could be a fatal mistake. Charlie was to my right, pinned against the passenger door. I could see him holding up his hands, watching the man like a possessive bird of prey. He could reach the gun, maybe, or had he already? Give me your money, the man shouted with a deep, thick accent, expressing each syllable with fearful urgency. Money, now. Suddenly, there was an explosion so loud it shook my body and rang in my ears, and the black man fell to the floor. Charlie must have shot him, I thought. I wanted to look at him to see what had happened, but my body was frozen with fear. The black man hit the ground hard and was writhing helplessly. Then he did not move at all. His gun lay by his head. He was dead. Charlie. This is Charlie. Ed was sometimes a bit of a girl. And if it wasn't for his lovely wife, Judy, and how tactile they were with each other, I would wonder if he was gay. He was certainly effeminate, but it didn't detract from his clever and mathematical mind. He was a genius in so many respects. We couldn't have done this deal without his forecasting, his knowledge, and I admired him completely. He was opening doors for us both with the factory investment. It was risky, but could bring good prospects to us both and wealth to its owner and the local farmers. The risk, however, was not as big as being on the side of a dirt road in the middle of a country we didn't know in the dead of night. I sensed his nervousness as Ed told me that where he'd put the gun, but it was probably a wise move. He was careful like that, always checking facts. We both knew about the gun, but only he had remembered it at this moment. Kobe had shown us how to shoot it before he left. It was well known that white men carried money and Kobe was protecting us as he had to leave suddenly due to his wife being taken ill. The meeting at the cocoa farm had gone well, but we were much longer than planned, not wanting to reject the warm hospitality of the farmer and his family, who were so thoroughly excited by our, by our arrival. Our taxi was booked for tomorrow morning for our flight home and I hadn't packed yet. The last thing we needed was any delay. I noticed a strange sense of melted rubber mixed with an unusual aroma, I thought from a nearby tree. Bush cricket sang and two bats flew overhead, disturbed by the loud explosive bang and dirt skid of our borrowed vehicle. Now the spare wheel was installed, we could continue with this godforsaken journey. I was about to get back in the Land Rover when there was an almighty crashing sound and I turned to see a local man with a gun. I almost wanted to laugh, but then the fear transferred like a shot from his eyes in the torchlight to my body and I thought I would soil myself. Ed, who was on my left, dropped the torch as the man moved around in front of the car. I put my hands above my head, desperate to show him I wasn't armed. We were no threat. He was hollering something, demanding money. A moment later, a gun fired and he went silent and fell. Ed, thank God you beauty, I thought. I didn't know how, but he must have picked up the gun from the bonnet. What a hero. 
I watched the local's body writhe on the ground before it became still, and I was rooted to the spot in horror. The headlights illuminated the blood as it seeped from the wound in his chest and out of his mouth to form a sickly small but growing puddle. Who could have heard? Would this attract attention? We needed to get out of here fast. It could ruin everything. But what do we do with that body? If we left it, they would find us. Would Ed be arrested for murder? Would I be an accomplice? And with that unthinkable idea, a plan came to mind and I found I could speak again. Ed, we need to bury the body and fast. Oof. That's it. Oof. Wow. I, yeah, I, I, I'm just <laughs> startled and stunned um, by what's been going on. And, and I am aware of the time, um, but I, I really want you just to say to us why it is you have taken us to Ghana, I believe it is, isn't it? Ghana, it is Ghana. Um, so um, in my 20s, I, I did quite a lot of backpacking. I took a year out of work. And uh, I went backpacking around the world, but I chose Africa for some reason. And I spent uh, quite a few months uh, trekking across Africa and I started in Ghana. And when I was there, there was a rumor it, where we were camping and there was a rumor in the campsite about the shooting that had happened. And it was it was a. Uh, it was just a rife rumor and we were all told to take care and be careful where we went and not to go too far out of the city if we had to go out of the city and we were like oh, okay um so yeah i always remembered that and and that's what this story is based on mm, wonderful can i ask when will it be out oh well, i'm hoping next year i'm still looking for a publisher for it so mm -hmm. um uh, I have an agent who's working very hard on my behalf to to find that deal for me. So so we're keeping all positive vibes out, out there. And, and I, I would love to say next year. Yeah, that's what we hope so as well. So um, I am sorry that we're going to have to draw our time together uh, to a close. Um, Maggie, thank you for coming on and, and just bringing just your magic in into the discussion it's so beautiful to see you thank you for that justine thank you for sharing with us not one but two books which is you know two for the price of one i think that that is always beautiful and may um, I you all as well i think what you do is wonderful and you're such a clever team as all of you it's, it's so lovely to be a part of what you do thank you a total pleasure because we love getting books out to people we love connecting readers and and, and writers and and you know just bringing new stories to people uh, i i think that that's really important but but thank you that you know for for that endorsement um and so it just remains for me to thank everybody watching um and the hope that you will stay connected with us across social media you can see i've gone into the darkness um well the fact that honey and stag are happy to work with people across genre so this is me doing my horror genre for you um but please um if you're an author out there and you would like us to do a virtual book launch with you or if you're interested in having a a book buzz for a title that you might already have out but you'd like a shout out for it again, then please do contact us um, because we'd just love to give you uh, that support in getting your work out there. Lastly, I just want to thank that awesome partner in crime there behind the scenes who actually, without whom none of this would happen. Kelly Lacey, you're awesome in the way that you just gather all this together. Thank you for, for all that you do in making Honey and Stag um, just the awesome magic that it is. So for now, from us, we want to say thank you and we'll see you again soon. Bye for now.